In this episode of XTV Newsers, we are talking to a guy who quit his TV news job to run a successful YouTube channel. I'm XTV producer Jennifer Moore, and right here with me is John Hanlon of the YouTube channel Beyond the Brick and former assignment editor slash web producer. John, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I've watched several of the episodes so far of this show, and it seems really interesting, so it's a, it's a great concept. I know. I, I would agree. So thank you so much for being here. And uh, can you tell people a little bit about your background in TV news? Sure. So I started as an intern, actually, if we go way back, a production intern at the local PBS station here in South Bend, Indiana, WNIT. I then moved into a part-time position at the NBC station, WNDU. And then after graduating from college, I got a full-time job at Wish in Indianapolis. And that's, and I was there for two years. So two years at WNDU, then two years at Wish. And then I left the job in Wish in May of last year, May of 2017, and have been doing YouTube full-time ever since. Woohoo! And what <laughs> was there anything specific, specifically that made you want to get into TV news? No, it was, I was really passionate about it. I, I still am passionate about the news business and about TV news and about video news and, and the whole world of media. I'm kind of a news and media junkie still, even though I don't work in that directly in news anymore. I'm still like that. And I think I just got a, a spark in that direction when I was in around high school age, which is kind of unusual for, for a high schooler to get, you know, obsessed with TV news. But, but that was kind of my situation. And so, uh, you know, I, I got, like I said, I got that first position at WNIT as an intern, kind of got a, a feel for the TV world and, and whether I wanted to stay, you know, more in production and like behind the scenes or whether I wanted to get more in the editorial side of news. And I was definitely feeling that pull toward, toward news. And so it was just, a, it was just a passion and that passion still continues. Like I said, it's, I, I enjoy everything about the media world. And I want to ask you, in your opinion, what are the best and worst parts about working in news? <laughs> well, like I said, I've, I've, I've watched a couple of your previous episodes. I'm going to have to agree with most people who say that the, hour, the, uh, the hours, the unusual hours of either working overnights, early mornings, late nights, all of those crazy hours are, are probably the, the single worst part of, of working in, in news. Uh, the, the pay, especially at the, the local level of, of smaller markets, is also really bad. So between the hours and the pay are, are, are definitely the two, the two worst things. I was kind of lucky in that um, I, I never had an overnight shift in my several years of working in TV. Oh, my news. God. Wow. I, okay, I was that's lucky, lucky to avoid that. I wish we didn't have an overnight shift for the assignment desk. There were about three or, three or four hours overnights where um, it was just the producers who were in charge of assignments. And so I worked both the, the late night shift for about half the time I was there, which got off around midnight. And then I worked the early morning shift, which came in at, uh, at 4 a.m. Um, so I worked both of those crazy hours, but I never actually was in overnight. So I was kind of lucky compared to a lot of uh, TV newsers who, who have those overnight shifts, which just absolutely wreck your, your sleep. And w what do you think was sort of like the highlight about working in news? Like for me, I think it was just always being at the center of action, especially at the assignment desk. You know, working in news in general is kind of being at the center of, of action, but even the assignment desk is even more at the center of action. It's, it's, you know what's going on. You're on top of everything. You're in the middle of the, the newsroom, in the middle of everything that's going on. So for me, it was just, it was that, uh, I guess, adrenaline rush and always knowing what's happening and jumping from one story to the next. And I think to, to work in news and especially in assignment, you kind of have to have the personality of jumping around. You're constantly multitasking and uh, kind of obsessed with what's going on right now and making sure you have the latest information. So it's just kind of that always knowing that you're the first to know and, and on top of everything that was one of my favorite things about working in news. Yeah. And I have to say, you guys did have some pretty interesting stories, at least when, when I was working with you in that capacity. Um, you guys had the Jared Fogel story. I mean, there's, there's actually a lot going on in Indianapolis. So it was never, you guys never had a boring day from looking at your website from what I could tell. No, it was a great market. And I enjoyed working at, I enjoyed working at all the places I've worked and I enjoyed my time at, at Wish a lot. Um, you know, I would have, I would have continued there if this, if the YouTube opportunity had not, had not popped up, but um, I, I, I still enjoyed that a lot. And I have to ask, um, is there something you think that something about the media industry that you might feel is kind of misunderstood by people? Well, I think it's difficult for viewers. You know, obviously they turn on the TV and they see the reporters and anchors and they don't see all of the dozens or, or hundreds of people working behind the scenes. So I think that for sure is always an interesting thing. I, I always enjoyed 
showing friends or family around the, the studio and around the, the newsroom and around the building when I, when I worked at, in TV, just because they got to see that there's a whole lot more that happens than, than what you see when you turn on the TV. And there are a lot of people doing a lot of different things that are never seen by the general public. So that's, that's always something that I like to point out is uh, you know, people like me on the assignment desk, producers, editors, uh, even the photographers who are behind the camera, all of those people you never see, but there's a lot happening there. There are a lot of moving pieces um, so that when you turn on the TV, you see that anchor and reporter and they're prepared. They know what to say. They know they're in the right location. All of that happens because of all of these people behind the scenes. No, that's and, so uh, true. <laughs> and also with, I, I think the whole, you know, fake news and all that stuff that I think it's also important for people to understand that whether it's a reporter or an anchor or a producer or editor, whoever it may be, you know, these are people who are working really hard. Uh, they're working crazy hours as we already talked about. Uh, they're doing their best to, to, to deliver a product, to, to keep it accurate, to, to tell the truth, to say what needs said, to do what needs done. And I think that a lot of times it's a, it's a thankless job because you just have people upset with the way you cover something or um, whatever it may be. And I think it's important for people to know that these are, there are a lot of people working behind the scenes and they're trying to do the be very best they can. Yeah. And I, I talked to one other assigned person who, who's worked on the desk so far and uh, we all remember the crazy calls yes, and uh, yes. crazy emails. And that, that can really take a lot out of you when you're dealing with people who are never happy and very upset with your station. So yeah. Little, I, I, I was, I was, I always got a laugh out of the crazy calls because they just come in constantly and it's, you know, you can't take them seriously or you, <laughs> if you, if you allow yourself to get upset by them, you'll just, you'll just live in anger constantly because they come in every day, uh, crazy callers. And uh, I always, I would always try to get a laugh out and the smile and not let myself get too wrapped up in the criticism or whatever crazy thing they were going on about. <laughs> and do you have any regulars, like the person that called like every day? Like we had a few uh, of those. Uh, we, we definitely did. <laughs> I, I can't, let's see, I can't think of really one off the top of my head, but we definitely had those people. A lot of times it's older people who, uh, you know, or they're, they spot some, uh, something on the air that they think is a mistake or there's a show that starts five seconds too late and they need to call and let us know about it or, or whatever it may be. Um, there were definitely those regulars and I'm trying to think if there was anybody off the top of my head, but I know it was a lot of, uh, usually a lot of older people who uh, are apparently really, really big fans of, of what we, uh, what we air on TV and just want to make sure that we're, uh, doing our job correctly, I guess. <laughs> they're really, they're keeping an eye on us. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. They're definitely keeping an eye on us. <laughs> and out of your time working in news, is there any particular story that really sticks out to you for some reason? I guess several stories, you know, during my time at WISH, um, one of the really big ones was we had, uh, you know, the governor, Mike Pence, was chosen as, as Donald Trump's vice president. So that was a, that was a huge deal, obviously, um, for, for, for Indianapolis and all of the Indianapolis news media and, and covering that situation from even the very beginning with the rumors that were popping up and trying to decide, okay, what, what part of this is accurate? Um, you know, and the, the governor was having meetings with, with, with Trump and, and all of these things were taking place. So that was really fascinating to see. Uh, a local story go to a, a national story. Um, so that was probably one of the largest stories that I've covered, that I covered in my, in my time in, in news. Also, uh, one another one that just came, comes to mind, uh, that we had a, a local school principal who uh, sadly died. It was an it a, a extremely sad story, one of the most, probably one of the most emotional stories that I covered. Um, her name was Susan Jordan. It was actually a, a bus that malfunctioned and the, the brake went off or something and the, the, the bus accelerated into basically into the building. But uh, the, the principal and some students were there and she pushed the kids out of the way and actually died because of it. The, the bus hit her and the kids uh, got out safely. So just a really emotional story. One of those, um, uh, one of those that stories that definitely sticks with you. And, and something that I won't, won't forget. It was just a very sad uh, circumstances around that. No, I, I definitely remember that. I also remember your, um, your beat, was it the Beach Grove Walmart that was having all those problems? <laughs> yes. Where yes. the police had been called there like, a, like way too many times. Yes, and the police constantly <laughs> called for, for crazy people at the Beach Grove Walmart. <laughs> there were all, several different viral videos of insane the stuff. The lady, the lady, there was that one where the lady was on the motor scooter and then there was <laughs> another lady and a kid and they were like throwing shampoo bottles at yeah, each other or something. That was one of the biggest, that happened that a lot. Was, the, the, the shampoo fight. and That it, was one of my favorites of all time, I think. Yeah, yeah, that was fantastic. Have well, you frequented that location at all? 
I've never been there. Beach Grove is south of Indianapolis. I, I have not actually been to that specific Walmart. Maybe that could be a vlog for your new channel, the, the, the ones about travel. No. Just, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just, what a, Indiana's most interesting travel but, destination. Yes, <laughs> that, that could be a thing. That could yeah, be a thing. Yeah. Well, um, uh, since we're talking about viral videos, you've probably seen quite a few go through the news cycle. Are there any characteristics or traits you feel these have in common? I guess with viral videos, it's, I mean, the, what makes it viral is probably because there's something crazy or weird, like we were just talking about with the shampoo fight. <laughs> um, so that's definitely a, a, a hallmark of, of viral videos is it just something unusual, something weird, especially if it involves kids or something recognizable or something iconic um, that, that people are familiar with. Uh, are, are definitely a couple aspects of, of a viral video. And I guess it just depends on the situation. I mean, it can be almost anything, right? I mean, that, that's kind of the, the idea there is that um, you know, different, whether it's a, a stunt that somebody pulls or something that accidentally happens, um, it can be almost anything. But definitely something weird or, or super crazy or, or you know, it's probably the number one aspect of a, a viral video. We really do like crazy. And yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. You know, it gets people's attention. You know, we got to be honest, you know, like that crazy does get attention. So it, it does work. I mean, might be bad publicity, but it is publicity. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do want to ask, so you've worked with a lot of people in media relations and public relations. Um, if you were coming up with sort of like a guideline for them, are there any maybe maybe pieces of advice you'd offer up as, as far as how to, how to develop relationships with media outlets or maybe even how to better work with them? Well, I think it's important to understand that whether, well, if you're working with, for example, like local TV news producers or whatever it may be, um, make sure you have something that you're offering them, obviously. I mean, that's kind of obvious, but you know, the, your local media or national media, whatever it may be, is not looking to advertise your company or business or outlet for free. That's, that's not the purpose of what they do. So you have to actually offer something in return, whether it's your knowledge on a certain topic or you're talking about an, uh, a charitable event, whatever it may be. For example, with our YouTube channel, uh, we work with, uh, we don't usually work with local media, but we do uh, for a charity event, which we do is a, a 24 hour live stream actually to raise money to purchase uh, Lego sets for kids in hospitals. And that happens on the day after Thanksgiving every year. It's a really big event for us, and we usually get local TV and local radio to cover the event, and so that's a lot of fun, and, and it's a great event for them to cover as well because it's these, uh, you know, uh, a local entity that's um, that's raising money for charity, and so it's kind of something always if you're a if you're trying to get the word out about your whether it's a YouTube channel or whatever it may be, just keep in mind that you need to offer something in return. <laughs> They're not just sitting there waiting for people to call them up and, and want to advertise or whatever it may be. It's not free advertising. Uh, you have to you have to give them something in return. That's a really good point. And there's even little things like I was just talking to someone who was sending out a press release and, and they were like, should I send a PDF or a Word doc? And I said, neither, please don't do that. <laughs> yeah. um, and everyone, the funny thing is all of their friends commented and said PDF. And you know what it was like getting PDFs, right? Yes, um, yes. PDFs I, I, were kind of the worst. I, I could never figure out why people oh didn't just gosh. put that information straight into the email. Why, why, why hassle with the attachment? It didn't really make any sense. And nothing when writing press releases no. is just keep them as simple as possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Short to the point and is, yeah. is if, you, like, if you can avoid having attachments, that's just one more thing for us to open. Right, And I right. feel like people don't get that. And I was like, please. <laughs> when the, the other person was like, what about an editable, like a, an editable PDF that copy paste does not matter. Like <laughs> keep it easy for them. If it can't fit in the body of the email, then that's, that probably shouldn't be in your press release. No, um, that's exactly right. And keeping it, keeping it short oh. and simple with the, the information very clear is important as well. Because again, the people sitting on the assignment desk or whoever it may be don't have time to read your no, uh, 6,000 word essay. And you knew when you got the PDF, you're like, oh my gosh, I cannot copy and paste this. I do not want to type all this stuff out. Like, cause remember, <laughs> remember dealing with that? Oh yeah. Get oh it. yeah, exactly. And then if, or, or they would try to be creative and they would have all these like crazy graphics and stuff. Yeah. And it was yeah. hard for you to read and like get the gist of what it was. Yeah. And I was no, just, nobody cares. All, all we want is the text, the basic yeah. information. <laughs> basic information. Keep it simple. You don't have to go crazy with the fonts or anything, but yeah, exactly. Very good information. And, um, I want to, I do also want to talk about uh, people that are maybe considering a career in television news or broadcasting. Um, I obviously it was even different when you got into the business than it is now. What advice would you give to 
students or aspiring journalists right now in, in 2018? I'd say get as much experience as you possibly can, um, whether it be volunteering, uh, internships, whatever it may be, just absolutely get that experience. And then if you're, if you're really passionate about it, you know, do the, do the hustle on the side and, and uh, yeah. you know, know what you're talking about. Read the, the, the blogs, read the news websites, stay up to date on what's happening in the, in the industry or just happening in news in general if you're wanting to do TV news. Um, I think that's really Im important. You know, I would uh, meet some, uh, whether it be interns or whoever they may be, um, and there was a lot of times that, um, you know, there's a lot of information out there with the internet that uh, it's pretty easy for you to come in prepared to a, a system and you can, that could be something that in a job interview or whatever it may be, um, that, that gives you a level up because you have been staying up on industry news, you know what's happening in the news world, um, you know a little bit about TV and how it works, um, you're obviously still learning, you've got to get experience from somewhere, but just take every opportunity. And with YouTube, I mean, that's a fantastic uh, platform. If you're wanting to get into TV news, we'll start producing some content for YouTube, whether it be just showing off your editing skills, if you're wanting to be a reporter, show off your voiceover or whatever it is you want to do, you can put that information out there. It doesn't matter if anybody watches it, but it's at least experience for you. And it's uh, content that you could show a potential employer to say, Hey, here's what I've done though. I haven't had a, I haven't had a job that I'm getting into the business. Here's a little bit of what I've done. And it just shows that you're willing to go the extra mile. Yeah. That's such a good point because you don't have to necessarily wait for someone to give you a reporting job. If you want to story tell, what's stopping you from storytelling on YouTube? You have your own platform. It's a very low barrier to entry. You can produce your own stories and, and at least practice your package skills or practice putting things together and interviewing people. So, I mean, I, that's the thing. Like, if you're really motivated, you can really make it happen for yourself and use that as a portfolio, like as sort of your portfolio. And uh, you ended up leaving the business. So can you walk us through, you know, kind of like why you decided to leave the business and sort of how you transitioned out? Sure. So uh, let me go back real quickly to the beginning of, of our YouTube channel. So it's called Beyond the Brick. And we started that and my brother and I in, uh, we started the, it, it started actually as a, an audio only podcast in, in 2011. And then in 2012, we, we started uh, making YouTube videos. And we ran it for a long time. Um, I guess that'd be five years before I left in, uh, before I left my job in, in May of 2017. Uh, so we ran it for five years and it was making a little bit of money here and there, whatever. Um, we were just doing it because we, we were, uh, we were passionate about it. Uh, we did it for fun, uh, whatever. And then it finally became a job in, in May, 2017. We were able, we were making enough money that we could, um, make it a career. Um, so, uh, it just got to a point where it was, you know, I was, because we travel about half the year now for the, to make the videos um, for the channel that it, uh, the, obviously the vacation time at, at Wish was, was not nearly as enough. I was constantly restrained because I, I could not get the days off that I wanted to. And, you know, that's understandable. They can't give you half the year off, <laughs> but um, it just made the most sense. I would have been, uh, you know, I was an opportunity sitting there to, to, to pursue this on a, a, a much larger level. So once I did step away from, from my job, it's just exploded in, in growth. And I think in 2017, we, we doubled our, our number of subscribers. It's now right about 250,000. Um, so we've just seen incredible growth and we've, we're planning to have an even, even bigger 2018, hopefully. When I've been following your progress, and I, so a lot of people have been asking me since I left my job, um, you know, how do you start a YouTube channel? How do you grow a YouTube channel? You guys have obviously gone bonkers with success. Um, you guys are about to cross, probably at this point, you'll be at 250K. And um, do you remember initially how long it took you even to get those first like thousand subscribers? I don't remember the first thousand, but I will say that it took in, uh, we hit, uh, 100,000 in, um, October of 2016. So like I said, we doubled subscribers in 2017. So yeah. there's a major snowball effect. I don't remember exactly where we were, um, you know, if to hit a thousand or 5,000, that type of thing, but it, but it took five years to hit a hundred thousand. And then we did one year uh, to hit another hundred thousand. So it's a long process. And again, you know, we, uh, we did it for five years before we were really making enough money that it could be even considered a, a job. So it, it's about, and you hear this all the time from YouTubers, but if you're wanting to make a YouTube channel, um, you're not going to see overnight success. Almost nobody does, um, unless you have some kind of fame coming into it. <laughs> um, or you're Jake, or your last name is Paul. I don't yeah, know. yeah. Though even those guys, they yeah. you know, they, had to, they had to build up their own audience. You know, ten years ago they were nothing. So even them, uh, they had to, everybody has to start from somewhere. So it's just about 
uh, staying passionate about whatever the topic is that you're, you're covering, whether it's even your life with a vlog, whatever it may be, um, putting in a lot of hard work. I would come home on, uh, when I worked at Wish, I would spend many weekends um, editing, uh, full of editing videos, you know, eight, sometimes even eight and 10 hours a day, uh, editing videos the entire day. Um, because the, the work needed done, I, I do all the video editing. My brother, Joshua, uh, who's also studying for his master's uh, degree, he doesn't have as much time to focus on the business. Oh, wow. so the editing, a lot of the, um, the, the publishing, that type of stuff is all, is all done by me. And it has been for a while. And so, you know, I would come home from, uh, from work at Wish and I'd put in two or three hours even later that day. And then again, uh, weekends, I would put in many hours um, just to, to keep the videos going out there. We've been publishing at least one video a day now for, I don't even two and a half years, two years, something like that. Um, and then sometimes uh, we did a couple months in uh, November and December this past year, we did actually two videos every single day. Um, so it's constant editing um, in, in our, in what we do and the, the way that we, uh, our videos are, are made is constant editing, but there is a lot of hard work, no matter even uh, channels who put out one video a week or one video a month, whatever it may be more, you know, uh, stuff that's edited more or, or longer form content or whatever, um, you know, they still have to put on a lot of hard work. So it's, it's years of hard work to get to the point where, where it's going to be a full-time job. And that's the case for almost every YouTube channel out there. They, they put in what you see today at a channel that has a million subscribers or 500,000 subscribers or however many subscribers is years of hard work and, and a passion that really pushes them through. And how did you guys come up with the idea for the channel? Like what was there? So, I, obviously you guys are into Legos, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. Um, but was there a reason you decided to go into that specific direction? Well, like I mentioned, it started out as a podcast. So it used to be my brother would do um, like, like we're talking now, Skype, Skype type interviews actually with Google plus Hangouts, which are mm -hmm. still around um, years ago, back in 2011. Uh, and so that's what it used to be. And he would interview Lego builders um, around the world, everywhere. Um, and so he did that for, uh, a while and, um, but then we decided, Hey, we had a, uh, we were fortunate to live in the South Bend, Indiana area with Chicago only a couple hours away. So we said, okay, let's, let's pick up a video camera and just take this show on the road and, and talk to these guys in person. And the, the show in Chicago is one of the largest Lego events in the world. And so we were able to produce quite a lot of content without going too far away from home. And so it really worked out well for our situation. And then from there, it just exploded. We started at that one event and we're now, like I said, traveling half the year all around the world. Last year we were in uh, like uh, 14 different countries or something in uh, Russia and all, all over, all over the place. But basically we just, um, for anybody who isn't familiar with exactly how our videos work, basically we, we attend Lego conventions and exhibitions that, that happen all over. Most of them are in the United States, but they're in, around the world as well. And we interview the builders about whatever the uh, custom Lego creation they've made. So this is everything you can possibly imagine, art, architecture, movie-based stuff, comics, whatever it may be, all of the, you, you know, by now a lot of people have probably seen gigantic Lego custom creations. Most people are usually familiar with at least the idea. And then we put those videos out on, on our channel and we focus obviously on the, um, the, the most impressive, the biggest stuff. So at a show like the one in Chicago, that will pull in like, uh, there'll be a, a thousand Lego builders who gather from around the world to display their creations at that event. And then there'll be a couple of days where the public can come in and see them as well. So that's basically what we do. And it just started with uh, the podcast and, and Joshua doing the Skype type interviews with, uh, with builders. And then we just picked up a camera and said, hey, let's, let's go talk to them in person. And then it's just been, we've added events every single year since then, but it started out as, hey, we'll just do this on the side. And when we get a chance and, and, and do the editing work whenever, whenever I have time, and then we just add in more and more and it's, it's worked out really well. And it's really smart too, because every time you go to one of these events, you know, you don't just get one video out of it. You get many videos out of right. one of just one thing. So it does seem like, I think your approach was very, um, was, was definitely very smart to do that instead of, you know, like going to an event and only having one video out of it. How many people would you shoot at all these events? So that's something we figured out as we went along. So we will go to an event now and we'll, we'll get like 50 videos out of it because we will do a video on, um, you know, there's one video on each creation. So whatever it may be. And then our, our video title and the thumbnail and all of that is based around that creation. So actually in the very beginning, if you go back and look at some of our really old videos, we would put out like, uh, like those first couple of events we went to, we put out like one video that's like 15 minutes long and it'll be titled like large Lego creations or something. Well, well, nobody watched that because you know, the, 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 the key, you need, you need those keywords in there. You need something to yeah. grab people specifically to, 
a creation. So now all of our videos are about individual creations. And we get, again, whether it's fans of a movie who, who may be watching, these aren't necessarily all um, Lego fans. We have about a million YouTube views a week at this point, a million to a million and a half. And I think in 2017, we averaged just over a million YouTube videos a week. And those are, uh, you know, some of those are Lego fans, but many of them are just people who find our videos because they're interested in the, whatever the creation is based on, whether it's a TV show or a book or a movie or um, some piece of architecture or some piece of art, whatever it may be. This is something that if you look down our channel and you don't see anything that interests you, I think that would be unusual because we have history, a, a lot of uh, many, many history related topics, that, but they're all Lego creations based on these topics. So uh, one thing that makes our content so unique is that we have a lot of Lego fans who obviously follow us for just everything we produce, but then there are all of these other fan groups and just general topics that we tap into um, that have a mass appeal, a public appeal. No, I agree. And uh, do you have a lot of younger viewers, would you say? It's hard to tell. If you look at our analytics, I think they, they aren't showing that, that we have as many younger viewers as we know we have. I think maybe these the kids and their uh, teenage kids, young teenage kids, or even younger than that, are perhaps either... Uh, signing up with a, the, an incorrect age or maybe they're using their parents using their YouTube parents account. login yeah yeah so we definitely have a young audience i think i mean it's hard to say again because the the analytics are skewed on the ages um but we it's definitely a, a large percentage of of our audience is under uh, under 18. well toy channels are really going bananas so that's uh you guys picked i think a very good um area to focus on so a lot of people don't understand YouTube and how the money works without getting into specifics. Can you explain to people like, you know, if you do build a YouTube channel of your size, um, how they might potentially make revenue? Sure. Yeah. Everybody, everybody's always afraid to ask this question, but I really don't mind, mind okay. talking about it all because it is the, the, the number one thing that everybody's interested in. So we are actually a little unique in the way that we, our, our revenue comes from. So we are 90% funded by YouTube ads themselves, mm -hmm. which to my understanding is, is rather unique. Most channels- It does seem pretty rare. Yeah, mo most channels that YouTube ad revenue- um, which we should say just for anybody who isn't familiar with that. So basically YouTube will run ads against your videos. We don't handle what those ads are. We don't handle working with the advertisers, anything like that. I think YouTube just gives us 50% of the, the revenue uh, based on those ads, but they're all handled by YouTube, which is great. And so we, 90% of our revenue comes from those YouTube ads. And then the other 10% is we have individual sponsors. So there are a lot of third party uh, customizer Lego companies that make various accessories for for Lego um, uh, creations, and so we have worked with several companies over the years uh, to advertise on our videos. So when you watch one of our videos, you might see a YouTube ad at the very very beginning, and then you will see our little intro animation, and then you'll see another five second ad, uh, and that is from those companies we work with directly. Those are Lego related companies, and that's where about 10 percent of our revenue comes from. But it's always been interesting to me because as I hear a lot of YouTubers talk about where their revenue comes from. It's usually a much smaller percentage for uh, YouTube ads themselves. A lot of YouTubers are able to make a lot of money from things like merchandising or Patreon. Uh, we've actually tried both of the th those things and they just, they just don't work for us for some reason. Uh, we had a Patreon that we ran for uh, a very short while and we got um, uh, very, very little interest in it. And so we kind of shut it down and said, okay, we'll, we'll focus on other things. And we haven't been able to get um, uh, much interest in the way of merchandising either. We did a little bit of related to the charity event that I mentioned earlier. We sold t-shirts to raise money for that and that did okay. Um, but just general uh, merchandising sales were, uh, you know, that's, that's not pulling in any cash for us. But, but we're doing just fine with the, the YouTube ads. I think because of the, the toy industry is one of the, the largest or fastest growing uh, genres on on YouTube, so uh, we're apparently tapping into that, mm -hmm. and and we're doing just fine with with the uh, the YouTube advertising. But it's always interesting to, to hear from YouTubers about exactly where the money comes from. And again, that's one of the the most interesting topics that everybody's always interested in is how exactly how do, do you, you make money? How, how, yeah, how, how do you make money with this? And it and it does it is for us. It's primarily that those those ads that that YouTube runs. That is interesting. You say that too, because um, you know obviously with the new YouTube demonded the new YouTube partner program policy, a lot of uh, particularly small channels, like my channels are pretty small. They're being told, hey, you really need to just diversify and do other things. I think for some channels, those things would work. But for others, I don't think it would be a natural fit like to do merch or to do Patreon. And I think with Patreon, it seems like everyone has a Patreon now. So it's like, 
if everyone's hitting you up for money at all these channels, you can only, you know, support so many creators. Um, Right, exactly. There are, it does seem like absolutely everybody's Like everyone has a Patreon and it's like, even for stuff where I'm like, why would I don't, like I only donate to one, um, but I don't, I mean, I have a sewing channel. I don't, I I don't think I would feel comfortable really doing that at this point. Um, Or, and you know, with the merch thing, I'm telling people on my videos not to buy clothing too. (laughs) For me to be selling t-shirts. So sometimes I think they mean well, or they, they, they kind of put more creators in this box saying, you know, this would work for you. I, you know, I don't think a lot of these things, some of them they might work for, you know, others, they may not. Like, again, I tell people not to buy mass produced clothing. So if I started selling t-shirts like sewing report t-shirts, I think that'd be a pretty big conflict of interest. So I'm like, (laughs) I don't, I don't think that'd be right for me, Uh, but I really appreciate you sharing some of these, this insight. Um, because I think a lot of people have a lot of questions about it or they don't really know how it works. Um, have you also kind of noticed that there's, um, I've seen there's definitely sort of like a little bit of a gap between um, like my TV friends and then the people in the YouTube community. I definitely feel like there's like a little bit of a, like a communication gap. I don't know. Like, like TV people, I feel like they don't really understand the YouTube community, but vice versa, the people you meet in the YouTube community, they have definitely like an impression of like the news media that may not be totally accurate. So I don't know if I'm just talking out of my head, but. No, absolutely. And I think uh, YouTube is such an interesting platform and partially because it is so new and uh, the rules are still being written on, on exactly how you do all of this. And when, like we were just talking about with the Patreon situation, Patreon makes a lot of money for some creators and then other channels like ours, we can't seem to get anybody to, to go for it. So it, it's just a trial and error because of uh, the, into, the, the, the YouTube platform. You just have to figure out what works for you and your channel and your audience figure out your audience, knowing, knowing your audience and who they are is, is extremely important. As we travel to Lego events uh, with our, with our audience, it's, it's, it's great because we're going to these events. We're talking to hundreds of people throughout the year. And this, these are our audience. This is, this is the people who we, who we are making videos for. We're listening to their feedback. We're hearing what they have to say. We're hearing what channels they watch and what they enjoy from other YouTube channels and so it's great. And knowing your audience is really important. And that's one thing that's always worked really well for us because we are going to these events. A lot of channels, it, it does not, it does not work so well like that. You know, if you are a vlogger and you're documenting your life and that, and that's great. And maybe you're a really entertaining person, but how often are you seeing your, your YouTube audience? Well, basically never, maybe at some, something like a VidCon, a big convention or something, but, um, uh, incorporating that, that viewer feedback is really, really important because, people are still writing the rules of YouTube and what works and what doesn't work for one channel. Um, it may be completely different for another channel. And, and so to say that, um, to say that, um, I don't know where I was going with that, but, but it's, it's just really important to, to know that, uh, what's happening on YouTube is, is changing all the time. And because of that, um, you have to be constantly experimenting. Do you feel like a lot of your skills from your TV news background really translate over there? I mean, a little bit, again, I, I like I said, a, a, a while back, um, I'm a media junkie, so I'm kind of like I'm I'm kind of obsessed with just media and 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 news came along with that. But even just the what people consume, how they consume it, uh, where it's being consumed, how we can make things that people want to watch and and watch more, all of that I'm just absolutely obsessed with. I'm I'm reading blogs all the time. I'm trying to stay up on industry news as much as I possibly can. Um, so absolutely skills translate over and, and uh, certainly on the when i was at the assignment desk my job was also half as a web producer and so i was crafting facebook posts and 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 social media posts and um writing web stories and all of that stuff related to web so that certainly had a lot of overlap as well yeah i think i think the whole part that fascinates me about youtube is figuring out this algorithm figuring out how to get youtube to promote your videos or you know you know kind of get a better click through rate coming up with the thumbnails like that, I think is like, I think what TV people might gravitate towards, you know, is kind of figuring out that puzzle. And right. Absolutely. Change. Yeah. And that's, that's the challenge that I love about YouTube is how, how can you get ahead? You got to have to constantly work about how can I improve what I'm doing? How can I get ahead? How can I continue to deliver this product? If it's something that people like, and if it's not, how can I change to make it something people like? And the, the YouTube algorithm is such a fascinating, um, uh, concept or, or, uh, something that, that I find really interesting is, is how can you best play to the YouTube algorithm and get your videos in front of the, as many people as possible. And, and it's really surprising. I've been fr- quite frequently surprised with a video that I put out that, um, 
that I maybe don't think will be as popular as something else, but then it, it takes off and it explodes because for whatever reason, maybe there was a, a related video that, that it kept appearing next to and, the, and YouTube's algorithm kept favoring it. And it's really interesting to go back and, and look at, hey, this was popular, this wasn't. And some of the videos that we put the most work into aren't necessarily the most popular and, and others that we um, you know, almost didn't post to whatever the case may be are, are what have 500,000 or a million views. Isn't that crazy? Whatever. What's your, what's your most viewed video on the channel? It's about 20 million views. So we have something called the great ball contraption. Um, and we have done a number of these videos because they are incredibly popular. Mm -hmm. And the, our number one video is, is one of those great ball contraption uh, videos with 20 million views. So basically look, uh, the great ball contraption is all of these different Lego contraptions and little modules that are placed next to each other on a table and a whole bunch of these uh, great ball contraption builders will get together at a show and they'll display like 200 of these modules next to each other, but they can be all kinds of crazy things. Some are just basic that they, and they move, uh, I should say they move balls, uh, Lego balls all around in a, in a circle on the, each module. So it's quite a mesmerizing thing to watch us and people love to, to see like the engineering that goes into it and all of the interesting pieces because there are all kinds of crazy modules that people put together. But we've done a whole bunch of those videos and they are, they're incredibly popular. And you recently start, kind of started launching another channel, right? The, the uh, Destination, was it Destinations Through History, I think? Destinations of History, History. yes. So this, this is a brand new channel. I don't even know. We might have like a dozen subscribers on it or something like I'm that. Subscribed. I'm subscribed. <laughs> okay, we got at least one then. Right, <laughs> but it's, it, it's brand new. So as we're traveling, uh, my brother, I mentioned earlier, he, he's studying to get a master's degree. It's actually in military history. So he has a, a deep interest in history. And as we travel around, we go to all of these uh, museums and different, and different historical sites and things. So we thought, well, let's start up a new channel and just kind of document all of these places we go to. And so on Destinations of History, it's Joshua explaining the significance of whatever this site may be, the, uh, what, what's interesting about it. Um, uh, we were in the, uh, the Moscow in Russia in the metro stations which they have uh, incredibly, they have the, one of the most beautiful metro stations with, uh, in the world with all of these art and all kinds of crazy stuff. So we made a video there and just at interesting places we find ourselves at. So it's very much a side project. Um, we're putting out very, videos very irregularly, but we will uh, get them out as soon as possible. And uh, we kind of stack them up as we travel and then I get them out as soon as I can get them edited. Well, it um, totally, but, but it's, a, it's a fun yeah. thing. It totally makes sense because you're going to you're going to all these places anyways, right. and you're probably doing touristy stuff along with your Lego stuff. Yeah. So why not do? And I've noticed like there's so many, you know, like kind of like travel vlogs or whatever, just kind of explaining different places to people or going to places where maybe someone's researching. I think it's a really good idea. Yeah, so we've had we've had great feedback from it, just from friends and family and the little the very small audience that it has right now. So we're planning to continue putting out some content over there, but it's it's certainly not a a money making venture anytime soon. <laughs> and uh, what's it like working with your brother so closely on a project that you've been doing for so long? Yeah, so we uh, we work really really well together, and um, so it's been a a joint venture for Beyond the Break from the very start. Um, so uh, we do work, we, we work really well together and uh, we, our strengths and weaknesses play off each other really well. And uh, he does, he's, I, it's great to see the, the improvement that, that he's, you know, in front of the camera and interviewing people and things like that. And he's always been great at it, but even getting better at it and me getting better on the, the behind the scenes stuff with shooting the videos and editing and all of that stuff. It's great to see how our, our strengths are improving through the process as well, but we work really well together. That's really neat. And you know what? More people probably watch him on your YouTube channel than a lot of local reporters. Isn't that kind of <laughs> mind blowing? Yeah, like, it, it is amazing to think that, you know, a million people a week are watching, are watching him and watching his videos. But we always say that uh, the, so much of the focus of what we do is on the actual builder and on the, 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 the creation that's on display that sometimes you never even see him or you might hear his voice asking questions of the builder, interviewing the builder. Um, but but he is certainly not, rarely is he the focus in any of the videos. So that's great as well. We're very, we're extremely community focused in what we do. So uh, unlike a lot of YouTube channels that again, maybe you're a vlogger or whatever you may be, um, uh, which is with the, the, the channel is based around you and your personality, which is great. Um, but with us, our, our content is very much based around not ourselves or what we're doing or what we're saying, but around uh, spotlighting other people and the, the, creations and the amazing masterpieces that they have on display. Sometimes these things have taken these builders have years to put together 
And so we're all about spotlighting them. And uh, sometimes, like I said, you don't even see Joshua in the video. You'll just occasionally hear his voice or whatever the case may be. But it's great. He does a good job with them. Very cool. Well, I was going to ask you what your favorite social media platform is. Um, <laughs> can I assume it's YouTube? or? <laughs> but, I mean, it could be something else. I don't know. No, it definitely is. And sometimes I wonder if YouTube even qualifies still as a social network. I don't know. It seems like it's its own it's, thing. Now. Yeah, it's definitely bigger than that. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of beyond a social network. But uh, YouTube, we also are very active on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Um, and I've been on Twitter for years and years. I was actually on Twitter before I was even on Facebook or, or YouTube or anything. I'm, I, I, it's weird how uh, something about news maybe and the, the way that Twitter works, it seems like news people are most it's still obsessed. still pretty quick to get information on Twitter. I yeah, think. I guess because of the, the, the chronological order of everything and the, the, how fast the information comes out, it seems like everybody who's ever worked in news loves Twitter. Okay, so now that you're out of the news business, I, th I feel like the news industry is going through kind of an interesting time. Um, what do you think the business could do on the whole to maybe make itself relevant uh, and maybe try to adapt to some of this, the changes we've seen with this whole social media landscape? Yeah. Well, I guess that's the billion dollar question. If I knew exactly what, <laughs> if I, I knew exactly no. what they could do, I, I, I could make a lot of money. Yeah, but. you could probably consult uh, for, for a lot of stations. Yeah. Yeah, or just or just start my own thing. <laughs> um, but but that is a really interesting question. I think I don't know if we've yet figured out exactly what needs to take place. Um, it's it's an interesting question to ask, especially yesterday with uh, CNN shutting down Beam, yes. Casey Neistat's Beam, and I had always looked at Beam as. Um, I thought it was a fantastic example of attracting young people to news and their their type of content and their their uh, style. I thought was really good, and I thought they were. Um, you know, I, I thought they'd be around for a while. I was really stunned actually to see that news just yesterday, that that Beam was being shut down. Um, but I, I think the way that they de do news, the way that some of the channels like um, Vox or uh, Philip DeFranco's uh, channel, uh, I, I think those are really interesting. I think they're pulling in young people. Where obviously TV news, mm -hmm. I think the average age of a, a cable news viewer is like 58 years old or something like that. So uh, the, these, these channels are pulling in a much younger audience, which you're going to have to do to, 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 to draw an audience, to, to get interest in the, in the news from, uh, from younger people. I, so, feel like, I feel like the news industry really needs to keep a, put more of these social media stars on their radar. Like when I would ask people in news if they've heard of Philip DeFranco, like 99% of them have never heard the name before. And I'm like, seriously, you can't be working in news and at least not know who some of these people are. Or I would see, hear the criticism from, like, when I would tell people about the show, I'm like, yeah, I've been watching the show. They'd be like, well, he doesn't really do real news, you know? He's just kind of grabbing stuff from other places and talking about it. And yes, again, I've noticed the DeFranco team could probably use more editorial people on their staff, but they've got the audience and they've got money. They're largely fan-funded, so... I mean, it would only be a matter of time before they get those things in place. Um, right. So no, I, I, that criticism is more like maybe like not jealousy, but maybe a little more contempt. I don't know. Right. No, I think there is a <laughs> there is definitely a tendency to brush off um, yeah. from the the news, uh, the established mainstream media to, to kind of brush off these guys. Um, but that's and that's I think they some of them do need to start doing maybe some more original reporting. And that's a little yeah. bit what Beam had done. They even sent some international some people internationally to cover international affairs. And that was one thing that I thought was really interesting for them. And we've seen uh, other uh, people trying to do news on YouTube do something similar. So I, I don't know what exactly the future holds for news and, and online. Um, I think people are still figuring it out. But I certainly like what I'm seeing from from people like Philip DeFranco from uh, beam before they went away and, and that type of thing. So I think we will see more of those kinds of outlets pop up, but I don't know if anybody's exactly doing it the way that it's going to be done in five years or 10 years. I think we're still figuring it out. No, I, I would agree. I would definitely agree. All right. Well, uh, John, where can people find you guys online? And I will link to all your stuff below as well. Um, but obviously your channel is beyond the brick. Is there anything else you want to, to give a shout out to? So we are all over, like I mentioned, Beyond the Break on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. And we've actually been focusing a lot on Facebook and growing our Facebook audience quite a bit now and publishing natively to Facebook. So you can follow Yay. us there and actually see all of our content on Facebook if you're more active on Facebook. And then on Twitter, we usually just share the uh, the, the links to YouTube. But yeah, we're all over the place. So uh, YouTube, obviously, prim primarily uh, to, to make sure you don't miss anything, that's the best place to go. But we're all over. All right. And John, last thing, I want to give you the opportunity to ask uh, this audience any question you want. Wow. Um, 
I guess related to the conversation we were just having on, on news, because I do like to follow, though I'm not in the news in business anymore, I do like to follow the industry and I'm still very interested in, in kind of the future of news, especially as it relates to, to YouTube and video and online. So I guess for, for anybody watching, um, what are your news sources? Are you using people like Philip DeFranco? Are you still watching cable news or your local news? Or do you get your news from Facebook? friends who share links to articles, where, where are you getting your news from, especially if it's from YouTube channels, what, what specific YouTube channels are you, are you getting your news from? Well, thank you so much again, John. This has been a wonderful conversation. And again, John is a uh, very successful YouTuber who quit his TV news job because his channel was doing so well. Um, thank you again. And uh, guys out there, definitely answer John's question below in the comments, where do you get your news? And if you are a fellow ex-TV newser and you want to be featured on this show, feel free to comment below. You can hit me up on Twitter, whatever you want to do. Um, I'd love to feature you if you have something to say, and I'll see you guys next time.